having me. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak this morning. Uh, here are the disclosures that my company asked me to put up here, but I think the one I'd rather say is that these concepts I want to talk about this morning are, they're nothing new. They're, they've been discussed all the way back into the 70s, uh, particularly with the Naval Blood Research Lab and Dr. Valeri. Uh, but we're trying to give a, a new lease on life and, and uh, bring these concepts into present day. So first of all, the product that we have is called Rejuvisol, Rejuvisol solution. It is an aqueous solution uh, com uh, comprised of inosine pyruvate, adenine, and some phosphates. It is added to a unit of red blood cells that have been stored, so we're talking about allogeneic red cells. It's incubated for an hour, which allows the constituents to be internalized into the red cells and kickstart a multi-step metabolic reaction. Our primary purpose is to look at, and what the FDA has asked us to look at, is ATP and 2,3-DPG synthesis. So they have asked us to take 42-day-old red cells, rejuvenate them, characterize them, and then rejuvenate them. And our approvals are based on being able to restore both those parameters back to fresh levels. Visually, I think for the, I've talked to some of you this week, and some are familiar with the storage lesion of red cells, others are not. Visually, I think the storage lesion is easy to look at or acknowledge um, by the image on the left. These are stored red blood cells that have been stored in a refrigerator for 42 days. They do not look very good. Uh, we can, through the process of rejuvenation, improve the morphology and cell membrane health of these red cells and there's an image of those same red cells on the right hand side. Most importantly for tissue oxygenation is 2,3-DPG. Uh, the chart on the left is in the green is the profile of 2,3-DPG as it goes through storage in the, in, the, in the bag. And by seven days this is already 50 percent depleted, by 14 days it's almost completely depleted. I like to use the analogy for 2,3-DPG as the opposite of Velcro. So 2,3-DPG, the more you have, the easier it is to offload oxygen from the red cell. It doesn't want to stick as hard. When there is no, do, no DPG in the red cells, that hemoglobin has a high affinity for binding the oxygen. At the same pressure gradient, it won't let go of as much oxygen. Johns Hopkins showed this in a study two years ago with uh, uh, spinal surgery patients, immediately post-op, they showed a 50% deficit in 2,3-DPG concentration. This took, and you can see, out three days post-operatively, that deficit had not fully recovered. Real briefly, just to kind of go through some of the biochemistries that are important to us when we look at rejuvenation, uh, certainly the morphology score, um, being able to restore the morphology of those red cells. From uh, the three columns that are important there, fresh, day 42, and after rejuvenation and washing. So as you would expect, fresh red cells have a very healthy membrane that, and a high quality morphology. After storage, this decays. And with rejuvenation, we're able to repair that most of the way. 2,3-TBG follows a similar trend as what I showed in that previous chart. By day 42, there's almost zero DPG in these red cells. But after rejuvenation, we can restore that, and we can restore it to, on average, 104% of fresh. P50, which I will talk about here in a minute in more detail, is, uh, follows a similar trend and with a deficit, um, certainly by 42 days. But with rejuvenation, we can pull that P50, we can right shift the dissociation curve and bring it into the mid-30s. And, and which would be above 100% or above the fresh level on those paired samples. So real briefly, for those of you, I've talked to some of you this week and uh, asked you if you knew what the dissociation curve was. A lot of you did. Some of you said no. Some of you said yes, but it's been a while. So here's the dissociation curve. It is the relationship between oxygen saturation and the pressure, uh, and the pressure there. So as the pressure in the lungs decreases into the tissues as the blood circulates, the pressure drops, pulling off, the oxygen, uh, pulling off oxygen from the hemoglobin and reducing the oxygen saturation. There's a variety of parameters that can impact the quality, or sorry, impact 
um, that relationship and depending on which direction those parameters change can either left shift this curve or right shift this curve. And this can be done, this is done naturally in the patient and it's done artificially in red cells that are being stored and what we're doing is shifting this uh, curve with rejuvenation. So this curve, the basic curve, we can take and extract additional information from to come up with some, uh, some more insight into what is happening with this relationship. First of all, we will take, we take this curve and we look at what the oxygen extraction or oxygen uh, release capacity is or extraction ratio. And we can multiply it, uh, that hemoglobin oxygen constant by a pressure gradient. This gives us a constant and depending on, w on the um, physiology of this curve will, will impact it in a positive or negative direction. We can multiply this then by the amount of hemoglobin in our red cell pack to give us what we're trying to consider a oxygen dose. So this would be a volume of oxygen. And then we can multiply it by a cardiac output, et cetera, and come up with either delivered oxygen or VO2 or oxygen consumption or extraction. But what happens when this curve shifts to the left during storage? At the same pressure level, we, we do not pull off as much oxygen. So the oxygen saturation is, becomes higher. And this trend stays true even at lower pressure levels. Um, in, in the, in the delta between that saturation change is even greater. With rejuvenation or naturally shifting this dissociation curve to the right, we, are, we change how much oxygen can be extracted at that same pressure gradient. So we took, in this study, we took 65 units of blood, prospectively collected them from healthy donors at day zero, characterized their, their dissociation curves, stored them for 42 days, repeated that characterization, and then after rejuvenation. And you can see the, the, the colored lines are the means and the, the dotted lines are the 95th percent confidence intervals. So you can see there is a distinct separation at each of those ages or qualities of red cells. We then take that through our analysis and can get a total releasable oxygen per unit that we characterized. And what, we were, what really fascinated us or interested us in this is Look at the comparison between day 42 and uh, these are also day 42 rejuvenated red cells. We can increase at the same pressure gradient the amount of oxygen being extracted by about threefold. You might say, well, we don't transfuse blood that's 42 days old, Matt. Come on now. Um, our institution is much better at managing the blood. It's not that old. So we, looked at, we also looked at 21-day-old blood, which is about the national average right now. The same trends hold true, and what I, visually we, were, we are um, showing this change in saturation gradient at the, uh, at the top left of the, of the left-hand chart with those bars. And you can see from uh, fresh to stored blood that saturation change becomes smaller, and after rejuvenation we get a larger extraction percentage. And the same trends hold true for P50 for the release capacity and 2,3-DPG. We took that and we said, okay, so Johns Hopkins published this study in spinal surgery where the patients got a couple units of blood. There was some continued bleeding likely, and then they showed this deficit in 2,3-DPG postoperatively. So what could be happening there? So this is a, these next few slides are all uh, mathematical modeling. It's not in a patient, so this is not patient data. But, um, so we took a hypothetical patient who comes in for surgery with a normal hemoglobin level. During the course of surgery, the hemoglobin drops to a transfusion trigger of seven. And, and then this patient, this myth, uh, hypothetical patient, receives three units of blood as there is continued bleeding to maintain a hemoglobin between seven and eight. Then we looked at what would be the, the oxygen extraction or VO2 uh, to provide oxygen to the tissues in this patient. So the patient has a healthy, healthy baseline simply by virtue of reducing the circulating blood cell mass that uh, the available oxygen in the system is reduced. 
And what we found really interesting in this one was that with each continued transfusion, we were replacing um, fully, uh, fully or high 2,3 DPG red cells from the patient. Those continue to bleed out. We replaced that with more and more, higher and higher concentration of stored red cells thereby further reducing the total oxygen being extracted into the system. Again, this is a very simple model, assuming that the cardiac output is constant and all other hemodynamic variables are constant. So certainly, likely not the case in reality, but I think the trend is important. If we rejuvenated one of those three units, we could pull back some of that oxygen availability. With two, that trend was even further. And with, if we rejuvenated and transfused all three units, we could provide 92% of baseline oxygen while maintaining a, hemoglo a circulating hemoglobin of seven grams. So we flipped, the, we flipped the discussion then and said, instead of holding the cardiac output constant, what if we hold the tissue oxygenation constant at a baseline? So what would the cardiac output need to be in order to compensate for the reduced blood cell mass and any reductions due to stored red cells. And we looked at this with even day zero blood, if you were able to transfuse day zero blood, day seven, 21, 42, and after rejuvenation. Again, on the left is the total releasable oxygen per unit of red cells. And you can see these trends are similar to what I uh, already shown. On the right hand side is the change in, the percent change in cardiac output required to maintain that baseline VO2. And even with fresh blood in the green, if you were able to transfuse day zero blood because of the reduced uh, circulating hematocrit or hemoglobin, you would have to increase that cardiac output by about 40%. With transfusing older blood, this even manifested with a higher cardiac output required to, to maintain normal tissue oxygenation. With rejuvenation, we were able to reduce that required increase down to about 20% of baseline. I think this phenomenon is important to consider when you have patients that have a, have a limited cardiac reserve or an inability to improve their cardiac output, they would not be able to achieve the 50% increase in cardiac output in order to maintain proper, normal, healthy tissue oxygenation. We published this study with Duke University earlier this year, and it's the same trend as what I've just shown, but I like the way they presented it here with delivered oxygen on the left and VO2 or oxygen extraction in the middle. And you can see with delivered oxygen, by simply transfusing red cells, we increase the circulating hemoglobin. The amount of oxygen that's bound to the hemoglobin is still circulating, and you see an increase in DO2. However, when you look at what is able to be pulled off of that hemoglobin at a given pressure gradient, you can see that in the red bars, which are standard stored red cells, these were about 21 days, there was no added benefit with each unit being transfused. However, with rejuvenation, you see a step function increase in this model, and then a, a bifurcation in the oxygen extraction ratio. There are a few animal studies available that suggest that these models are at least trajectory, in the right trajectory. In an anemic baboon model, the researchers with Dr. Valeri's lab showed that there was improved myocardial performance and, um, and cerebral blood flow in those animals. Uh, earlier this year, we published a paper with the University of Leicester in a porcine model of transfusion showing both in the bag and in circulation reductions in plasma-free hemoglobin and, and in the tissues, in the organ tissues, a prevention of iron accumulation as well as reduced renal injury. And uh, similarly, in a, a, a Dutch study from a few years ago looked at an isovolemic exchange model for rats and transfused either fresh blood, stored, rejuvenated, or no transfusion at all and showed that the localized renal tissue uh, hypoxia was reduced with rejuvenated blood. A, an historical example in humans in cardiac surgery by, on bypass looked at 
uh, high two, they compared high 2-3 DPG red cells, or, that which were 150% of normal, with red cells that had 70% of normal. So these red cells would have likely been less than seven days old. And they showed that the P50 in the high DPG red cells increased the, was increased in the patient uh, postoperatively, as well as the cardiac index was significantly improved in those patients uh, in response to a fluid load uh, compared to the control group. So that's what's been done. Uh, what are we doing? What are we going from here? There is a uh, study we have ongoing at Duke University right now in healthy subjects. These are volunteers that are coming in, donating two units of blood. We characterize their VO2, their VO2 max, and work capacity uh, before donation. Then those red cells are stored for two weeks, and, the, and these, the volunteers are randomized to either receiving standard red cells or after rejuvenation. And we will look at uh, pre and post transfusion VO2 again. And this will be a, a functional uh, validation of the models we're showing. Also, we have uh, what we're calling, or what's being called, the Rejuvenate trial. This is a multi-center RCT that will begin this summer in England at six centers. It is designed to look at post-operative organ function and injury. We have two co-primary endpoints, which will be uh, specifically in renal and myocardial function, and a host, as you can see, a host of secondary outcomes targeting organ quality, or organ function, post-operatively, and uh, post-op recovery. So uh, to conclude, we know that with rejuvenation, we can right shift the P50, right shift the dissociation curve. In our preclinical research, we've shown improvement in tissue oxygenation and organ function and a reduction of tissue hypoxia. Our models are, uh, corroborate the animal findings, and we are looking at these uh, several clinical studies to help prove this hypothesis. So thank you. Any questions? I had you. a couple of questions about the, a uh, couple of people have asked about the cost of the product and how that, how that all works. It is more than a unit of blood. <laughs> I will leave it at that. <laughs> it's more than the acquisition cost. How many times can you rejuvenate a unit of bank blood? We, in our labs, we've only looked at it doing it one time. Um, but once the units are rejuvenated, if we put them back into storage, the, nor the uh, normal storage lesion process begins again. And so I think you could hypothetically do it once after that. Our, we're not cleared for doing that, though. Do you have any opinion on washing the bank blood and the cell saver before rejuvenating it? Is that something that you've looked at or discussed? So, our, yeah, I, kinda, I skipped over kind of the nuts and bolts of the processing. Our process is to take the unit of blood, rejuvenol is added, it's incubated for one hour uh, at 37 degrees Celsius. This is because we're looking at a, me a metabolic reaction that is temperature dependent. So elevating that temperature accelerates this, um, the rejuvenation. We can do this in a refrigerated environment. It just takes several days. Um, and then FDA requires us to wash the blood after incubation. So it's a mandatory part of our process anyway. Thank you.